You can turn with me to the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John and chapter 2, John chapter 2 this evening. We're going to begin our reading at verse 13. John chapter 2 and verse 13. This is the word of the Lord. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple. Will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Then therefore he was raised from the dead. When he, therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. We'll enter reading there at verse number 22. Let us just come before the Lord again in prayer before we come to the preaching of his word. Our gracious Heavenly Father, uh, as we pray so often, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Heavenly Father, uh, that we have it in our English tongue. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've preserved it, even though the devil and his minions have tried to destroy your word over centuries, yet still we have it here this evening. And we thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for the truths that it, it teaches us. We thank you for the wonderful grace that we see in it, the wonderful mercy that we read of. And Heavenly Father, we read of it so often, the, the chiefest of sinners being wonderfully and graciously saved because of your mercy, because of your grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that. And Heavenly Father, as we come to, to take time to, to study your word, to apply it to our hearts, Lord, we would ask that you would help, help each and every one of us to understand what we will hear, all by the power of the Spirit of God. And Heavenly Father, again, we would just remember those who are not with us this evening. Uh, again, we remember Ian and Sarah tonight. And Lord, be with them. We think of Eva as well, Lord. Be with her this evening as she's in the hospital. Again, continue to strengthen her and give her that patience that she needs at this time. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we also think of Joan, who joins us so often in the prayer meeting on a Thursday evening at the moment. Lord, we would ask you that you would undertake for the situation that she finds herself in now. Be with her. Give her the strength that she needs. Give her the wisdom and discernment that she needs to deal with the situation that she's in. She's our, our sister in Christ. She may be many miles away, Lord. But yet, Lord, our prayers are for her. And Lord, we would ask that you will answer those prayers. Sort that situation out in, in your way, in your time, that you will be glorified. So again, Lord, we would ask that you will just undertake for this hour... Be with each and every one of us and help us, Lord, to glorify you and exalt your Son. Amen. 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 Tonight we're going to look at Christ cleansing the temple. Now I'm in the camp of Christ cleansed the temple twice. Okay, there are those who would say that he only did it once. Um, they, they have, their arguments for that are pretty weak. In fact, they're probably less than weak. They're almost non-existent. But there are some who would say that he only cleansed the temple once. So as we come to this portion of scripture, earlier on in the chapter, we read that Christ performed his first miracle. It was the miracle at the wedding at Canaan. He turned the water into wine. We see that at the very beginning of chapter 2. And then the scripture tells us in verse 12, after this. So after he'd been to the wedding, he went down to Capernaum. And it says in verse 12 that he went down with his mother, he went down with his brothers, and he went down with the disciples. And he stayed there for a few days. Then in the very next verse, the verse, first verse we read this evening, verse 13, John tells us that the Passover was at hand and Jesus went to Jerusalem. 
So what we see in this portion of scripture is a very short period of time, a brief window of time for Christ, beginning at Cana at the wedding, then going down to Capernaum, staying there for a few days, then heading to Jerusalem. And then Christ enters the temple and he cleanses it. Now, in the Synoptic Gospels, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they record the cleansing of the temple just after Christ arrived in Jerusalem, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on his final week on this earth. So do two different times and two different cleansings. Also with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they describe the cleansing of the temple. When they do that, there, there are a number of differences between that, their description of the cleansing of the temple and John's uh, account of it. In John, after Jesus is, uh, or does cleanse the temple, he's confronted immediately. Right away he is confronted. In the Synoptic Gospels, it's the next day before he's confronted. Then again, in John's account of the cleansing of the temple, we read that he made a whip of cords. But again, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's no mention of this. So I truly believe that Christ, at the beginning of his ministry, cleansed the temple because it was necessary to do that. And then at the end of his ministry, he did the same thing. He cleansed the temple, again because it was necessary to do. So as we come to John chapter 2, this is the beginning of Christ's ministry. And he enters the temple, the house of God. And he finds that those are, there are people there selling oxen, sheep, and pigeons. There's money changers there as well, all sitting inside, conducting their business inside the temple walls. It was an ancient shopping mall almost, inside the walls of the temple. Now you must understand, and bear with me as I explain this, please. Those who were living far from Jerusalem, say at Passover or Pentecost or the, the Feast of Booths, who were not able to go to Jerusalem and bring their own oxen, their own pigeons or their own sheep, they would bring money. And that money would be changed so that they could buy oxen, sheep, pigeons. It says in Deuteronomy, if you want to turn with me or want to take a note of it, it's Deuteronomy chapter 14 and verse 22. We'll start at verse 22. It says these words, You shall tithe all the yield of your seed, that comes from the field year by year. And before the Lord your God in the place that he shall choose to make his name dwell there, you shall eat the tithe of your grain and of your wine and of your oil and your firstborn of your herd and flock, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Now listen to this. And if your way is too long for you, so that you are not able to carry the tithe when the Lord your God blesses you because the place is too far from you, which the Lord your God chooses to set his name there, then you shall turn it into money and bind up the money in your hand and go to that place that the Lord God chooses. And it goes on. So, so around the temple, a whole commercial enterprise ha has sprung up. There was need for money changers. But how did that, that, this market of entrepreneurs get into actually into the temple, into the grounds of the temple? I, quite simply, I think the easiest way to answer that is greed. It, it's, it's greed. Animals were needed, incense was needed, oil was needed, salt and wine and other items were all needed for sacrifice and for offerings. So I think we can say that those who were in charge of the temple saw a commercial opportunity here. Saw that those who were outside the temple walls at this time selling these things were reaping profits so as they see it they think wait a minute here we, we could get a piece of this pie so they bring in the booze they bring in the market stalls inside the walls and in, into the court of the gentiles inside the temple walls so they can get a little bit of the action that they see going on about them now as you study and read about this you see that many of the men in charge offer these stalls and these market stalls to their own family and as a result of that, they make a lot of money. They line their pockets with money. And also they line the pockets of their family with money. It's all greed. It's all greed. But this is a place, it's, it, it was supposed to be a place of worship. A place of prayer. But it has become a, compar a commercial hub. Full of noise. Full of noise of people. People bartering and shouting. Changing their money. And it's not just a small number of people in at the time. 
that there would be thousands gathered at these great fe feasts. Thousands would come to Jerusalem at this time. They would go to the temple. There's a mass of people. But also, there, there's a mass of noise and going on with the animals as well. They're not just a few animals. There's hundreds of animals round about as well. I know. That whole area, and maybe some of you will remember this, that whole area used to be a place where they held the per cattle market. That whole area. It was a great expanse. So a great area for the cattle and the livestock at that time. And let me tell you, I did not need for someone to tell me, or to, to let me know that the market was on. Or had finished. I didn't go to the, have to go to the PA and check what times it was open and what time it was closing at. For when I walked past that particular place on my way to church, the smell that hit you was quite intense. No matter how hard they tried to clean it up, it was there. It was pungent. It was in your noses. And so can you imagine the same thing inside the temple? In the outer court of the temple. And again, we can only surmise that the reason for all this happening was because of man's greed. And Jesus walks in there. This is what he sees. This is what he smells. This is the house of God, his God. This is his father's house. This is a place where prayer and worship are supposed to be possible. But there's no hope of that happening with all this commotion going on. In Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 1 it says this. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God to draw near. To listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know what they are doing is evil. So as we come to the house of God, we are to be, we, we need to be in prayer. Even before we come through those doors. Before we come into the house of God, we need to pray that we will be ready listeners. With the help of the Spirit of God. Ready to hear. And not just to hear, but to worship God in truth and in spirit. But also to obey God and his word. We should pray for that before we, before we come into church. Giving a sacrifice is not the same as obedience. Listen, coming to the house of God is not enough. As a Christian, how dare we think that giving up an hour a week or maybe two will be coming on a Sunday evening. How dare we think that's enough for our God? How dare we? But many do. Think for a moment. Those who do come into the house of God and who come into church today who actually think that offer an empty sacrifice. A sacrifice, a work of attendance. That's what they're offering. Without obedience to God and his word, that truly is a sacrifice of a fool. A sacrifice of a fool because that person thinks that they can fool God. Fool an all-knowing God, an all-present God. Fool him with what they are doing, with what they are offering him. They think that they are doing good, good enough anyway. But all they are doing, he didn't use it on the people. He probably used it on the animals, drove the animals out. And of course, as the animals went out of the temple, the owners of those animals, the merchants, would follow their animals. Trying to get them, trying to retrieve them because their earnings were leaving the temple. They wanted to get them back. Then he poured the coins of the money changers. He turns over their tables. Chaos, no doubt, ensued. Can you imagine the scene? There's thousands of people shouting and, 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 and bartering. There's animals fleeing out of the temple. There's a smell of everything. And Christ then does all this. And then he says, take these things away and do not make my father's house a house of trade. God's house was being abused. And remember, God's house is a house of worship. That's what it's for. Everything that is done inside the house of God is to lead us to worship our Father God. Everything. So often today people talk about worship. Oh, we had a great time of worship and then we heard God's word being preached. God's word being preached is worship. Praying is worship. Singing is worship. Meditating upon his word is worship. You listening to God's word being preached is worship. <coughs> Everything that we do in the house of God should lead us to worship our God. That should, this is what should be happening here in the temple, in the court of the temple. 
And that's what should be happening in our church today. But the issue is, so often we are, the church is used for questionable activities. So often it is not used, used for the worship of God. And those who are inside the house of God, they forget about God's holiness when they're there. They forget about being reverent to God when they worship God in his house. Because they're worshipping a holy and righteous God. But they forget about that. Listen, the church of God is not a bingo hall. The church of God is not a social club. It's a place where God's word is explained and illustrated and applied to the believer's heart. And I understand that the church isn't a building. I understand that. But that does not give the excuse that the building we use as God's house. Now, I know some places have to rent buildings. But if we own our building, if it's ours, this does not give us an excuse to use it for all sorts of nonsense. It is, it is to be a place set aside for worship. Amen. Not for buying, not for selling. This is a house of God, a house of worship. This is a place where God's honour dwells. This is a place where we, we should come and we should be praising and we should be blessing God. And we should be continually doing that as we're in the house of God. God's house is a place where we should be happy to go to. Whenever we're called to go there. You know where I'm going now. Psalm 122 verse 1. We all know it. But is it true? <laughs> is it true? I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Are we glad to go to the house of God to worship him? Or is it laborious task for us? Or is, or is the happiness that we feel when we come to the house of God, is, is it because we know that we're going to be entertained, that we're going to be amused by things that are happening on the pulpits? They may have remembered it straight away. I, I believe they did remember it straight away. But in the light of verse 22, they also may have remembered it after the resurrection of Christ. But I do believe it was here they remembered this. But when David was writing this in Psalm 69, it seems that his life was consumed by the house of God. By the building of the house of God. He had a zeal to build the house of God. For God to be honoured in that house that he wanted to build. And because of this, not only did the nations rile against him, those nations are round about, but also his brothers. But as I said, this zeal that David had was showing. He had a passion for God's house. And it seems to consume every aspect of his life. He knew that God's house was a place of worship. It was to be a holy place. A place where God's people assembled. Where there was a reverence in that place. Where they could come and they could meet their God. And he was desperate. He yearned to build that for God. There was a zeal to build that for his God. Do we have that zeal for the house of God? Truly do we? For months. And not only actually over the last number of months, but certainly the problem has been magnified since the pandemic. People are happy, Christians are happy to stay at home and watch services on TV. Now again, if you're unwell, if you're, if you're aged, that's okay. Maybe you can't come out twice on a Sunday. We mm. understand that. But COVID seems to have given many people an excuse to stay at home. COVID has killed their zeal. If it hasn't killed their zeal, it certainly has vaccinated them from it. Their zeal for God and his house isn't as important as it used to be. You know, also, when we read in Romans chapter 10 about people having zeal, some people who have a zeal, but that zeal does not lead to their salvation. Romans 10 and verse 2 says this, For I bear them witness... That they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. People today fall into the same trap. Religious people of today, many people in the, that fill the pews of our churches up and down this land, they think that their zeal, they think that their good works, they think that their religious works will save them. That's what they think. When in fact, it's the opposite. Their good works, their religious works, their religious deeds or their religious endeavours actually stop them from being saved. They may be very sincere in what they're doing. 
They may be very devout in what they do, just like the Jews that Paul is talking to here in Romans chapter 10. Many are devout, devoted, many are sincere in what they're doing, but let us make it perfectly clear, that does not, cannot, will not save you. Amen. It won't. Only the blood of Christ can save you. It doesn't matter how devoted you are to their church, although you should be devoted to your church. It doesn't matter how devoted you are to the ministries inside your church, you should be devoted to them. It doesn't matter how devoted or how sincere you are in your works, none of that can save you. Only Christ and his precious blood will save. Amen. Then as we move on to verses 18 and 21, what we see is Christ talk about his death, talk about his resurrection. And, and it is interesting as we read this portion of scripture that those people, the religious people of the day, didn't actually question what he did. Okay, they didn't question what he did, but they did question his authority to do what he did. Look at verse 18 with me. Excuse me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Was it, and again we're just surmising, was it that some of the powers that be, some of the people in authority, had, had they at this point out, were they agreeing with what Christ had done? For surely they understood and they knew that the temple was not to be used as a mile, as a marketplace. They knew this. They were priests. They were Levites. They knew this was a place of worship. Yet they had done nothing to stop it. And they did not try and stop Christ from doing it. All they did was question his authority. What right have you to do what you've just done? What gives you the right to chase out these animals? What gives you the right to chase out these um, market stall holders? Now they know when they've heard that Jesus had claimed that this temple was his father's. So they wanted some kind of sign. They wanted some kind of spectacular sign from above to prove what he was saying was true. They wanted it there and then. Show us. Give us a sign. Why are you doing these things? Why, what authority have you to do these things? But Christ says, you will get a sign, but it will be in the future. Look what he says to them. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. So he's talking to the people who asked him the question here. The religious people of the day. This is who he's, he's answering. Those who are in authority. And he, as he answers the question, there's confusion and there's misunderstanding. For they cannot understand how this physical <coughs> temple that they see in front of them, how can that be rebuilt in such a short period of time? In three days, that's impossible. You cannot do that. They turn to Jesus, and remember, this doesn't make sense to them. And they say to Jesus, wait, wait a minute here. It's taken us 46 years to build this temple. How is it possible? How will you be able to raise it up in three days? Now, of course, we know and we understand that Christ is talking about his death and his resurrection upon the cross of Calvary. The religious people of the day had no understanding of this just now. <coughs> but his death and resurrection would truly be a sign that they were seeking. But they would not understand that. They would not see that. Their eyes and their hearts had been blinded by the religion. That's what blinded them from seeing this. And many would not believe. But this would be the supreme proof that who, he was who he said he was. That he was the son of God. That he was the Messiah. That he was the Christ. That he was the one who was prophesied of. He was the one who would come and save his people from their sins. Listen, some of those people who are asking that question. What authority do you have here? What authority have you have to do what you've just done? Some of those probably were the people in the crowd who were paying for his blood. Who were saying, crucify him. Crucify him. People even used these words, they twisted these words to mock Christ, to scorn him. Do you remember when Christ was before Caiaphas? The chief priests and the whole council were together and they were looking to find a false te testimony. They were looking for someone to come along and tell lies against the Lord Jesus. But they could not find anybody. Then all of a sudden two men came forward and said this. We are able to, he said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. 
twisting his words to provide a bogus and deceptive testimony. And when Christ was hanging on the cross of Calvary between the two thieves, the ones who passed by, the men and the women who passed by, they ridiculed and they mocked Christ. Scripture tells us that they wagged their heads in derision at him and saying this, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you're the son of God. Come down from that cross. Mocking Christ saying, if you could do that, if you could build the, 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 rebuild the temple, if that's true, if you could do that, then surely you could come down from this pitiful cross. <clears throat> Truly these people were blind, spiritually blind. For the, the only believe is that what Christ is actually saying what he was actually talking about was putting brick back upon brick back upon brick. That's what they were thinking Christ was talking about here. They were thinking of the material, not the spiritual. And listen, today many, many still seek a sign. Many still say, prove to me who this man was. They look for a material sign. Maybe that's someone like you. You need to have a sign. Maybe you've asked that question. Prove to me that he rose from the dead. Prove to me. Well, Scripture tells us that he rose from the dead and he appeared before not one, not two, not three. He appeared before more than 500 people. 500 people witnessed the resurrected Christ. But for many people, that's not good enough. Not good enough. Creation shows us that there is a creator. From the hills, from the mountains, to the seas, from a blade of grass to the human body itself, from the smallest of cells to DNA, DNA that each and every one of us has and is unique to us, given to us not by evolution, but by a creator. Amen. Now, of course, we cannot go to the blackboard or the whiteboard or the smartboard, I don't know what they're called nowadays, but we cannot go to them and come up with some kind of formula, some kind of God formula to prove God. That's what many people want. Write it on a, a smart board and show me that there is a God. They want the X divided by Y times Z. That equals God. We cannot do that. But listen, if Christ claimed to be God and he said that he was the only way to God, surely that is something that you have to consider, you have to investigate. All around us, we have the evidence, evidence that you may not believe in, but evidence that needs an explanation. That there is a creator. That there is a God. And one day you will stand before that God. Romans chapter 1 verse 20. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Listen, scripture is clear. Look out the window. Go for a drive in the country. You will see God revealed through his creation. Now, of course, this creation has been affected, it's been twisted. This once perfect creation has been distorted by the fall because of Adam's sin. And we see even that creation itself groans. But today, you're without excuse. You have enough evidence. God has revealed himself through nature, through creation, through his word, sufficiently revealed himself that we all have enough light of God to be without an excuse. You have no excuse. You cannot say, well, I did not know. You cannot say, well, I wasn't aware. You cannot say, God, you did not make it plain to me that you were real, that you existed. You know, probably if you're listening to this tonight online, the likelihood is you've heard the truth many, many times before. And yet in your pride and your stubbornness and your hardened heart, you still continue to reject the gospel of Christ because you're still looking for some kind of sign. And be truthful. Even if some miraculous sign came along your way, you would still find some excuse. You would still be wanting something else, something more to confirm what you already know in your heart. That's because of your pride, because of your stubbornness. Because of your hard heart. I don't know if I've told you, but I used to be in the jewellery trade. I say that because maybe, you know, Bush and Iron don't know that. But I used to be in the, the jewellery trade. And I worked with my brother-in-law. 
And listen, he was one of the best salesmen I've ever worked with. He's one of these people who could sell snow to the Eskimos. Honestly, he was that good. <clears throat> but also I've known people who could not sell anything. They couldn't sell a weight of a, a wet paper bag if you can do that. But I've known people who are not able to do that. But you know, come the last day, the last day before, when you stand before your judge, and I'm not talking about a man with a silly white wig on. I'm talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You will stand before him. And as you stand before him, it doesn't matter if you can argue. It does not matter if you can sell. It does not matter if you can try and claim ignorance in the situation. Your judge will either know you because you've accepted him as, as your saviour, because you went to him in repentance and in faith, or your judge will not know you personally because you have rejected him, because you've rejected the evidence that, you, that has been revealed to you through creation, through his word. And because you've rejected the truth that you've heard about Christ and all that he has done. And, 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 and year after year after year, you give excuses, excuse after excuse after excuse. And when you stand before your judge, you'll be there without an excuse, no matter what you think. You cannot argue, you cannot plead, for the time of pleading will have passed. When you stand there, you will hear those words. If you have come up with excuse after excuse, you will hear those words, depart from me. Not depart to another part of heaven that's not so nice. No, depart to an eternal hell because you rejected the Son of God. Depart, you're without excuse. Just very quickly in closing, in Luke, the book of Luke, Christ tells the parable of the great supper, a certain man who was about to give a great supper, a great banquet, and he invited many to this banquet, and he sends a service out, servant excuse me, out at the time of the supper to say to those who are invited, come, come, everything is ready, but all with one accord, each and every one of them came up with some excuse. One said, I've bought a new piece of ground. I, I have to go and tend to it. I cannot come. Excuse me. Another said, I've bought five oxen. I, I have to go and examine them. I have to test them. I cannot come. Another said, I'm newly wed. I have a wife now. I, therefore, I cannot come. Excuse me, I cannot go <coughs> to the supper that I've been invited to. So the servant goes back to the master and tells all these things, tells of all these excuses people to come to my house so that it may be filled. For I tell you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Listen tonight, are you making that same mistake? The same mistake that these people in the parable made. Is Christ calling you? Or are you making excuses? Oh, I have to do this first. I have to do that first. I have to get right. I have to be good before I can come to God. No. No, those are excuses. Warren Wersby says that those people, those excuse makers, are actually successful people in the eyes of their friends. But in the eyes of Christ, they're fools. They are fools. Is that you tonight? Tonight, no more looking for signs. Away with all your excuses. No more time for your excuses. Come to Christ and come believing. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we just give you thanks for your help this day. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that has went forth. And Lord, we would pray that it will accomplish everything that it's set out to do. Oh Lord, that those people who need to be convicted of their sin will be convicted of their sin. Those people who need to be brought to their knees in repentance, Lord, we pray that your word will do that by the power. We pray that your word just goes forth and speaks to each and every heart. Mm -hmm. But most of all, Lord, we pray for those who are, who are still bound by their sin, who still do not know Christ as their saviour. Lord, we pray for those people who are listening tonight. Speak to them, Lord, by your Spirit. And Heavenly Father, they will come up with excuses. We know we've done that ourselves. We've come up with excuses 
that we think no one else has ever come up with. But Lord, we know there's nothing new under the sun. And these people who are, who are hardened in heart or are stubborn in heart even just now, Heavenly Father, are coming up with excuses that we've all used. Lord, we would pray that your spirit will break down those excuses. And Lord, we would ask that you will show them that they need Christ. Not their works, not their good deeds, not their endeavours. They need Christ and the blood of Christ to deal with their sin. So Heavenly Father, we would pray for that this evening. That you will work in these people's lives. That you will change these people's lives. But Heavenly Father, that they will be gloriously and wonderfully saved. And Lord, we ask all these things in our wonderful Saviour's name, a strong and mighty name. Amen. Amen.